First, to begin with, I'm not here to add fear to fear. I'm here to tell you that it's going to work just fine. It's going to, to be smooth. Uh, but you have things to do, for sure. Um, so um, let me tell you a bit more about uh, who I am uh, and the organization that I work for. So I work for Signal Spam in France, which is the National Spam Reporting Center. Uh, it's a public-private uh, organization. And we collect spam reports from citizens and from French ISPs and we redistribute this information to the members of the association. Um, so we do operate uh, FBL, spam traps, uh, and uh, aggregated uh, data feeds that we redistribute to marketers or to ESPs. Um, and we also operate um, a blacklist uh, of, uh, of phishing. And um, I am here because I've worked closely um, with the Data Protection Authority in France, um, and I've been consulted about GDPR. Um, and although I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a jurist, um, I know the subject on your end, on your perspective, and that's why um, I was offered the opportunity to, to, to come here and speak about GDPR. And I've tried to make a very uh, email marketing orientated presentation. Um, feel free to interrupt me during the presentation. I think it will be more fluent if I answer your questions uh, when, when you have them. Um, okay. So, um, as I was telling you, we are working with uh, law enforcement in France, uh, notably the Data Protection Authority. We hand back to them uh, a feed about the biggest spammers we have in France, and that's what uh, direct their inquiries um, and uh, the control procedures, and that will change with GDPR. We work with web hosters, sorry, the, this, is, this slide is French, but all the rest will be in English. Um, we have ESPs as member, um, law enforcement, governmental authorities, um, marketers as well, and we work with security with vendors, and of course the ISPs. So with that, um, let's uh, jump into the subject that is the matter for, for us today. Oh, yep. The reports we get? The abuse, uh, the the abuse takers? Uh, I'm not sure I really understand your, your question, so can you reformulate it, please? Yeah. We are taking reports from uh, mainly the French-speaking community. So we'll be, ha we'll be having reports um, that concerns French networks mainly, but we do have uh, information about, inf uh, about abuses coming from other networks. So we redirect feeds uh, to the United States, Canada, Japan, New Zealand. Well, we have feeds that goes back to every country with which we have partnerships. And we do make uh, inquiries on, on other abuses, international abuses. Um, so what I wanted to tell you first, to begin with, um, is that marketing hasn't been very involved with GDPR. And for me, that is uh, a nonsense. All of you have been saying that the lawyers are taking um, the, the upper hand of it. Um, and, I'm not, and I'm feeling that you are missing the opportunity that GDPR could represent for you. Um, because some of your competitors will lose clients and you can open new markets if you are compliant. So that is, you should try to see GDPR as an opportunity. Besides, there are not a lot to do if you are already compliant with current best practices. So um, very basic and general information about GDPR, then I'll go into more specific and practical knowledge about GDPR. So uh, the text was voted two years ago, and it will come into effect uh, in, um, in two months now. Um, so we are in the transitional period, so you should have already taken measures in order to be fully compliant in two months. So I've heard many of you uh, being a bit afraid because you were not sure what you, you had to do. Um, you should have already started to, to, to make the word, but that's a bit uh, uh, 
well, that's not very comforting, so I'll skip this part. Uh, so the text was published on the 4th of May uh, 2016. You had two years application delay. Uh, it's a direct application, meaning normally when we have a text coming from the commission, we have to transpose it into national law. This is not the case. It is a regulation that we take and we put directly into national law. So we'll have nothing to discuss about it. Uh, it applies to all member states, obviously, and it repeals the former directive um, that you may or may not knew. Uh, and the most fearful part is that GDPR makes a provision for fines up to 20 millions for violations or up to 4% of the general turnover, of the annual turnover. So this is an increase. It's, uh, you have to multiply by eight uh, for current sanctions. For instance, uh, Darty in France had a data breach and they were fined for uh, 100 um, thousand euros, you will have to, to put at the very least um, 800,000 euros for, for, for this kind of infringements. So what is new? Um, if you apply current practices, then you're here. And what will change? You will see that it's not so much because on the consent it is already required. You all, you already have, need to have an existing customer relationship to email someone. Um, the new part would be the waking up of interest, and I will come to, to this a bit later. The requirements for the consent, well, you know that it needs to be voluntary, explicit, and transparent. Um, the new notion here is active, and you have um, some new or explicit uh, provisions. And the new thing is that you cannot couple um, your, the forms by which you, you, you collect the consent. You need to have a specific form for each type of consent. The ability to give consent, uh, it was not always defined. Now we know that you need to be uh, over 16 years of age to being able to, to make a consentment. There are some provisions, but I won't go uh, on details for that. Um, the obligation of proof is one of the big things that will change. Um, um, then I told a, a bit, uh, told a bit about this, and he was right. Um, now you will be, you'll have to be able to proof, to prove how the consent was collected, um, and you have to be able to document everything and to show in a transparent manner everything that you've done to ensure the consent was rightfully collected. Um, well, the possibility to revoke it was, it doesn't change really, it was mandatory um, through not always, we were not always sure, uh, depending on the European countries, how to do it. Now you know that it must be included in every email, but I'm sure you all uh, are already doing that. The legal notice required, it was not always the case, now you always have to specify the lawful basis on which you are emailing someone. So there are different uh, lawful bases. I will explain that uh, to you a bit later. And the sanction, they were obviously different within EU countries. Now it is uh, harmonized. One thing you may not know is that um, it's not all about GDPR. There are other things coming into force, notably the European Data Board uh, Protection Board. Um, this is new. Before that, you had data protection authorities in each country. And now we'll have <coughs> a, um, a general board, a supervisor, that will be in charge of uh, harmonizing all the laws within the countries. For instance, if we had um, a legal case in Ireland uh, regarding Facebook, for instance, the data protection authority in Ireland could take a, des a decision um, that would not be exactly the same as uh, the Data Protection Authority in France. Now, when we have um, a disagreement, we'll go to the EDPB and they harmonize all, um, well, all, the, all the law for the European countries. So now we are heading to, to what's really interesting. So this will be uh, the core of my presentation. And I've tried to summarize things so if you have all this principle in mind, and if you can 
be compliant with this obligation, you'll be, you'll be fairly compliant for, for now. So you have big pr principles that you need to, to have in mind. The first one is uh, the reducing of data, meaning you have to make sure that you collect only relevant, strictly relevant data for the goals you have declared. Um, for instance, um, I happened to be ordering a pizza uh, recently, and I was asked for my religion uh, on the formula, and I wasn't sure whether it was really uh, relevant. So I put only, uh, well, occasional pizza eater as a religion. But I, honestly, I think you, you, you're not, uh, you, should, uh, you should be not be doing this. Privacy by design, uh, well, obviously, uh, I think you will see what it means. The weighting up of interest. This is uh, something really interesting. Um, it already existed in the previous regime. Uh, it's a principle of proportionality, meaning that you need to have the data that exactly matches the goals for which you are collecting, for instance, um, the consents. And this is specifically what you have to, to document, uh, I think. So when you will be making your registers, be sure that the waking up of interest is the first principle that you have in mind. Accountability. Um, this is a regime of um, responsibility. From now on, you'll have someone in your company that will be held uh, responsible for all the treatments of data in your company, and the company itself will be held uh, accountable for the data it processes. It means that other companies or internet users will be able to go directly to your company and ask for the proof. They will uh, put an accusation, for instance, and you will be in charge of bringing the proof that all the treatment of data um, was lawful. And then the security, because now you have uh, provision for for breach, uh, for data breaches. So the obligations you have. You need to have uh, a register. So at the end, when you will have fully understand these principles and make all uh, the compliance measures you need to take, you have to keep this register. You will have to make sure that you don't have too many files in which uh, there are information. And a single register where you detail all your data process. You need to make, at some point, a PIA, which is a Privacy Impact Assessment. Um, each European country will detail how to make um, this PIA. For instance, in France, the Data Protection Authority uh, has documents explaining you how you can make your, your PIA. The companies will also have to name a DPO, which is a new function. It's a data privacy officer. Um, and anyone in your company will not be able to become a DPO. For instance, a manager or, uh, okay, cannot be a DPO. So you, you'll have to form someone to select someone that can assume this role. And he'll be responsible before the data protection authorities of each country of all the processes of your company. You also have um, a new rule for breach notification. So if you have um, a data breach in your company, you'll have to notify your data protection authority or, for instance, in, Fran in France, the uh, INSSC, which is the organization that is uh, responsible for um, uh, network security. And you will have 72 hours to make this notification from the moment that you were breached, not from the moment you realize you were breached, but from the moment you were breached. And also now, you have to secure people's rights. It's not um, an obligation of means, it's an obligation of results. So you have to guarantee those rights. Okay. So, Quick yeah? Um, you're speaking about the breach notification. Mm -hmm. It's not only for personal data breach, it's also for general yeah, but uh, almost everything is personal data. So whether you can identify someone directly or indirectly, um, you, you'll have 
to notify the breach. Previously, um, it was only um, vital infrastructure companies that needed to make these breach notifications. Now it will be extended to all companies dealing with personal data. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a wide definition of what is uh, the breach. So here I have compiled a, a few things you need to do in order to reduce the data, one of the big principles we saw earlier. So um, the first thing is to make sure that you only collect strictly relevant data. Well, that is pretty obvious and I've discussed that, that before. Um, but what are the legal basis um, for collecting uh, data? You can have the consent, the contract, um, the legal compliance, a vital interest for, for human, public interest or legitimate interest, but this is a bit dodgy, I think, uh, legitimate interest, because you could put a lot of things under this uh, legal basis. I think the Commission uh, will discard it at some point, because it's too vague. Um, but all the, uh, the other bases uh, I, I mentioned, you, you can put it in there, but most of you will work on the consent. You have to reduce the number of files containing data because uh, if you don't, you'll be exposed to more breaches. Uh, ban free field, that is for sure. Because you don't want to, when you, when you make a, um, a form, an online form, and that you keep a free field, you'll be dealing with data you absolutely don't want to, to, to be dealing with because people will put things in it. So ban free fields from your forms. And you have to set up purge measures uh, once the purpose is, is achieved. And this can be rather costly uh, for companies. So the very least you should do, um, as uh, Matthias was saying earlier, is uh, have the data anonymized. That is the very least you, you can do. Um, well, it's up to you, but I really think that, that you should find another way, maybe had a formula or multiple answers they can put. The free field, honestly, is dangerous, because sometimes they will put information that you don't want to have. That's my take on it. Profiling. Um, profiling is the subject of a specific article uh, on, the, um, on the new regulation. Um, and whenever personal data enables decision based on an automated process, then people have the right to object and to oppose. Um, so profiling will be a, a tricky point for you. So you have to be extra careful when you make a privacy impact assessment uh, about profiling on, on how it will impact people, the way you, you have the data, and you'll have to be very specific, give very specific information about how you are dealing with um, the data you are collecting, how it is used, the algorithm, what you do with this kind of data. What we said earlier is true. The key point here is transparency and having clear idea of what you're doing with the data, and being able to explain that to, to, to people. Definitely, definitely. Um, that's what I was saying a bit earlier. You need to have a specific consent and opt-in for each data treatment you have. So profiling may differ from the general consent uh, you, you, you are giving. So yeah, I think you, you should have. And could be by an opt-out or you think no. an opt-in specific? No, 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 it's a, it's an op it's a specific opt-in. Uh, remember that opt-out wasn't lawful before in France, uh, uh, in France, in Europe, except for uh, B2B. Um, there were specific provisions, but no, it has always been opt-in and double opt-in was recommended before. So if you were already on best practices level, then you shouldn't have any problem uh, with that. 
Um, I've tried to make another focus on, um, on consent for email marketing. So you have the definition um, of what is the consent for email marketing, and if really given specific informed and unambiguous indication of the data subjects which is by which he or she, by a statement or by a clear affirmative action, signifies agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her. So, the key points, unambiguous, freely given, you cannot submit um, the consent to uh, a game or, or to, to anything. It has to be very specific and freely given. Separate from other declarations, that is, I think, um, maybe the, the thing that today you will have um, the most difficulties uh, to be compliant, because often today you have one declaration to collect a consentment um, that allows you to do many things with that. You won't be able to do that anymore. It has to be informed, and um, the capacity to provide consent uh, is now 16, and it needs to be uh, explained as well. About your databases. That's not my role to combine that. It's, it's up to you to, to be very, very clever about this. But obviously, it is, it is an issue. Um, it is an issue. I don't see that you need to have many different type of consent and opt-in, because um, for, for what you were saying, you do need uh, a different um, opt-in. But on the whole, what will you do uh, with the, with the opt-ins? Emails regarding um, the products that interest people, and one other maybe opt-in to informed um, people that you will submit the data to uh, algorithm and intelligence in order to profile. Well, you need to have an information about that. For for me, that's all. Yeah, that's 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 one of the legal bases you, you can put in your in your in your opt-in. So about your databases, you need to ensure that um, they can sustain. That you need to ensure the sustainability, and you have um, a few key points you need to to, to ensure. Well, uh, we'll be talking about things we've already seen. So you need to make sure the data is uh, quality data. For that, you need to reduce the data. You need uh, to make provisions for the data conservation, and you need to update the data regularly. That's the purge measures we've discussed earlier. The lawfulness of the data processing will be based on whether you are keeping a, a register of everything that you are doing, on the specific information you'll be giving uh, to your prospects, and the lawfulness of the consent, all of this is pretty obvious. Uh, I think the most interesting point for you will be the sustainability of your databases. So you will need to make sure that everything is compliant uh, in order to secure people's rights. Um, the portability of the data, well, all those three points here, portability, modification, and suppression, uh, opposition and opt-out, they go together. You need to make sure that you can access any demand from uh, internet users. So it comes back to secure people's rights. And all this will be um, the job of the DPO to ensure the sustainability of, the, of your databases. So make sure you have a DPO that is uh, fully aware of all these aspects because he will be, um, he will be both a facilitator between and users and your company, and he will be liable for any breaches of any of these points. So what you can put um, 
in the consent when you are collecting the consent. And after that, I think I, I will stop because uh, it's already the time. Um, so you need to have identity and contact detail for the data processor. That is classic. Identity and contact details are the DPO, new thing. To what end the data is collected and the legal basis for it, we've discussed it, but you can put it on the consent. For instance, legitimate interest, consent, and so on. Any third parties that will access the data, um, knowing that you should be very careful um, about this. For instance, um, in Signal Spam, we were consulted by the Data Protection Authority in France, and they, were, they wanted to, to have the position of the industry. And the position we had is that uh, if you collect the data for a third party, you should be the one sending the email for the third party, but not give the data directly to the third party. So you should be in charge of the treatment. Um, you have to make sure you indicate the duration for the data conservation and the date of deletions for, for it. Uh, the mention of applicable rights. And lastly, um, the mention of any automated process resulting in the decision. So with that, if you put all this in the information, when you collect the consent, you're covered. So my message here is that if you were already uh, compliant with best practices, I don't think you have much to do. The key point here, as it has been said very rightfully, is documentation, transparency, being able to provide any proof that can be expected of you. Um, before, well, we all committed sins, uh, let's say, and you, you went to the data commission um, and you just made a treatment and you were, well, absolved, that won't be the case anymore. You'll need to be able to provide everything that the regulator would want you to provide and you'll be reliable for it. And that's the key point. That's the main difference. But if you document everything you have, if you have a strong register for your data treatment, there won't be any issue, I think. So with that, uh, I'll stop my presentation, and I'll take gladly any questions you may have for me. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Maaike with AV van Lanschot from the Netherlands. Uh, just a question about the focus on the consent bit. Um, does it have to be immediately in your screen up front? Can it be a drop down where you include this information? Can you link to your privacy policy where you find that information? Is there any? Um so it has to be, uh, you cannot link it to a general term of use. You have to, you have, to have it directly uh, on the same format where you collect the, the consent. It is better when it is um, written. For instance, uh, you could have oral consent before that. Uh, it won't be so easy to, to do that now. Uh, it's not stated, but obviously when you have to indicate all this information, it will be hard. So, so yeah, you, you should have everything written um, where on the same point of collect. You can. Amir? Hi, I'm Amir from Qatar Airways. And um, I want to ask so for the duration for data conservation and date of deletion, also uh, the last point, which is mention of any automated process resulting in decision making. Yeah. Does this need to be in a document with us, or is any of this information be customer facing, must be customer facing as well? So for, for example, if I'm collecting consent from the customer, do I need to outrightly say for how long this consent is going to be valid for? Um, this is something you can put in the term of use because it is, um, it is, mandat it is uh, regulated. It's two years, basically. So um, you won't have any different treatment uh, on that except if you um, belong to one of the categories that has specific provisions, but it's not the case. Um, so it's two years. 
So, so you can you 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 can mention the the mandatory delay by regulation. You don't have to specifically put it. Right. So, for example, a newsletter subscription, a normal one, would it also have an uh, expiry date of two years? And after that, we have to re-get the, um, the consent from the customer? If you don't have any uh, contact with your, the customer, he didn't make any purchase or anything, yeah, you have to purchase it. Okay. The contact means, I'm sorry, I'm just going on, but just to be very clear on that. So, of course, in between, we'd be sending them the emails, they'd be opening them, they'd be clicking on them, and if they make a purchase, only then this is a contact, or is yes. there an... Yes, if he makes a purchase, it is a contact. So, so we have to keep the uh, loop room. Okay, so, hold, hold on, let's get a microphone. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Dan, British Gas. Um, with utilities, we've got, we've got two-year contracts right in place, right? Yeah. So if we don't... Uh, we don't really sell anything, you know, from when customer comes on supply and when it ends, right? So we contact that customer, let's say, uh, three months before we start contacting that customer, three months before the contract expires, which is, let's say, uh, 21st month, right? And let's say that customer didn't respond to our, um, um, you know, contact extension mm -hmm. query, but a customer rolled into a standard tariff. Still a customer, didn't respond. Where does it place us? I've tried not to go in that direction uh, by giving you general principles um, and rules you have to, to have in mind. Because now you'll have to defend yourself. Um, so you'll just have to prove that you, that you tried to... to um, to make, uh, to make do for the, the right of, of the people. So if you go, um, if you are able to, to provide the proof to the commission, if you are able to explain your situation, I think you'll be fine. But you'll always have, you'll always have cases where you're not very compliant. So my take on, on, on this is that if you have a client that interacted with your emails, who uh, demonstrated interest for, for being contacted by you, then you'll be able to prove that uh, to the regulator. So you should be all right. Um, my message is that there are gray areas for sure. And as long as you are transparent, as you are able to uh, legitimately show your good face, then you should be all right. So what, uh, just another question based on yeah. that. Uh, so this is the gray area, right? Yeah. We're talking about, so what if, customer complains, right? Nothing happens uh, in these two years, but then customer complains. What happens there? What, what are the rules? What are the potential penalties? Is it that 20 million euros? You, yes. You, oh, that's it. Yeah. One complaint. Yes. Ouch. <laughs> but there yeah, won't be only one complaint. There will be organization uh, such as Signal Spam that will have many complaints for your company and will put them to the commissions or to the regulators. So, um, <clears throat> so my question sort of relates to what I was saying before. It's the nature of engagement. It's kind of quite interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> why would an open be the definition of engagement when we've already said that most people can show that they put a subject line, they didn't open the email and they went into the store. That's a form of engagement. What, is it okay to define that as part of, as I say, propensity? And why not? Because as I say, more people don't open email than do all the time. It's normal behavior. It's not a sign of unengagement. It's mm. just what people do. Um, will we remove billboards because someone drove past it 10 times without looking at it? It's that, that kind of question. Are, are you saying to me, and I, I just want to be sure about that because I'm not convinced I agree, I think that if you define legitimate interest as influencing behavior through your activity and they behave in the way that you have proven to influence, why would that not count? Uh, legitimate interest is um, too broad legal basis uh, for your activity. That's what I think. That's what I believe. Uh, you need to work on, on, on consent. Um, and I'm fairly sure that 
there will be something coming, maybe in the e-privacy directive or something else, that will be more specific about the legitimate interest. So honestly, don't work on, on this. Be well, here's the thing. I mean, no, this is not said in a horrible way. In mm. some ways, your business interest is served by them being more harsh and stupid. Do you get what I mean? The more difficult it is, the better it is for you. Uh, and the other way around. So I would definitely, if I was in your position, say, hey, don't run that risk. You could actually argue they may never get around to it. And all of those issues are, <laughs> you know, so I, it's a, it is a gray area. We're agreeing that gray areas are there for a reason. Um, and, and I'm just a little surprised that you feel that it's not possible to define engagement as constantly working with you. In, in Dan's situation, for example, they rolled out of contract into a different contract, okay? The fact that it's not the best contract they could have is not the same thing as saying they're no longer interested in British gas. Do you Absolutely. get what I mean? What I'd say is they're so interested in British gas, they want British gas to double their prices, and they're happy with it. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but I'm not ruling it out. I was uh, just saying that I'm not comfortable with answering this kind of specific questions. It's a lawyer who because should Because you that, yeah. have, yeah. not only that, but because I think it's more important that you put yourself in the shoes of uh, the people who you are interacted with and that you truly understand the spirit of the text. That's why I focus on the, on the principles, not only the obligations, and that I put slides specifically on the principles so that you can <coughs> feel what um, the regulator is expecting from us, because I'm concerned too with my association. Um, it's for all of us. So yeah, I'm not sure we should go into the specifics for now. It's Specifically, now that I see that we are not all of us uh, ready for, for it. So we have to take a lot of things into account. And if we go in the specifics right now, I think we'll, it will be well, harmful for, for us. That, that's my take, but we can discuss okay, it. Okay, um, Thomas is actually running a roundtable right now, so we, it's time for us to break into groups. So let's just give a round of applause to Thomas for his presentation. <laughs>